I get started on a topic and it leads to something else similar and so that's the case this time but we're going to talk about spiritual tools you know I've heard it said how many clamps does a handyman need and it's always well two more than he's got <laughs> and so we need spiritual tools to be able to function in our world today and this is unique to our time, what the, the spiritual tools that I'm talking about. I mean, of course, there are, you know, there's prayer, there's fasting, there's binding and loosing, and so on and so forth. And those are all tools, and that's not what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking about things that are necessary because of the way the world is right now. And th these are metaphors, okay, but they're, but they're tools. For example, tonight we're going to talk about depth finders. Now, a depth finder is a gizmo that you have on a boat, and it's sort of like sonar, actually. For, I, now, I, I'm just this is what I've discovered. I don't own one, but I know what they do uh, is it will tell you how deep the water is, and also if there's any fish down there, it'll tell you there's fish down there or if there's a submerged uh, car or something, it'll, it'll let you know what's down there uh, in, in the deep water. So, uh, and, and actually this is, this is found, a, a primitive version of this is found in the Bible in Acts chapter 27. Let me just give you this before we get into it. Acts chapter 27. This is the... the uh, story of Paul's shipwreck and um, the captain didn't listen to Paul and so they ended up getting blown around in a storm in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea and then they got close to this island and they didn't really know where they were but in verse 20 Acts chapter 27 verse 27 it says on the 14th night the fourteenth night had come, and we were drifting and being driven about in the Adriatic Sea, when about midnight the sailors began to suspect that we were drawing near to some land. Now that's an interesting point right there, because how did they know that they were drawing near to land? Of course, they're sailors, so I guess they... You know, they know the sea and they know the, the, the territory, I suppose. But we, in the body of Christ, I'm hearing this from many different sources, we know that we are right on the verge of some big things happening. Well, how do we know that? I guess kind of like how the sailors knew it. It's, it's like intuition maybe, or in our case, the Holy Spirit is warning us, uh, but it, it's, it's extrasensory, and I don't mean that in an occult way. Anyway, they realized they were drawing near to some land. So they took soundings. Well, their soundings was the early version of depth finding. They had a, a lead weight on the end of a, of a tether, and they would drop it down. And there was, I guess, markers ever so many feet or whatnot, so they would know how deep it was. Said they took soundings and they found 20 fathoms. And a little farther on, they sounded again and found 15 fathoms. So it's getting shallower. Then fearing that we might fall off our course onto rocks, well, that was a good thing to worry about because those ships were made of wood and if they encounter a rock, uh, that breaks the ship up. So they dropped four anchors from the stern and kept wishing for daybreak to come. <laughs> well, that sounds kind of like what a lot of the body of Christ is doing, you know, as we've dropped anchor and we're waiting for the rapture or something along that line. Okay, but my point in bringing this out was to show what depth finding was in the ancient world. But what we're going to talk about doesn't really have to do with water, or not literally. 
Now, I suppose you could take what we're going to talk about tonight, and, and if you found yourself over water, um, you, you could use some of these principles. Like, for example, we talk about navigating straits. Well, we're going to talk about that tonight, too. But we're really going to talk, first of all, about what we mean by the deep. So go to, in Genesis chapter 1, and I'm going to the King James Version here, because the Amplified and most of the modern translations uh, speak of the deep as if it's water. Well, um... Okay, I mean, but, but it's maybe not water the way we understand water because it talks about how God separated the waters above from the waters below. Well, what do we mean by that? I mean, we're talking about separating the ocean from the clouds? Well, maybe. But even if that's what is meant here, and I'm not sure that it is, there's something about this word deep I want us to look at because... We need to find it, and we need to understand it, and we need to be able to function at a deeper level of life than most people are living today. Okay, Genesis, I'm going to read this King James. Everybody knows this version. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. Now we know from the 45th chapter of Isaiah in the 18th verse that God did not create things, that he did not create the earth without form and void. So something happened between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. And it has to do with Satan. And we're going to talk about a little bit about what Satan does tonight. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. Well, we know darkness is not the character of God. It's the character of Satan. He's the prince of darkness, and God is light. But it said that the darkness was upon the face of the deep. Well, if we go back to Ezekiel chapter 28 and Isaiah chapter 12, we see about Lucifer's fall. And connecting that with this, we see that after Lucifer was fired from his job, which was to... Well, let's read that. Uh, keep the place here in Genesis 1, chapter 1, verse 2. We'll get back to that. We've really got some things to unpack here. Ezekiel 28, verse 14, describes what Satan, what Lucifer was doing before he fell and before he became Satan, the accuser. <clears throat> Ezekiel 28, 14 says, speaking to him and about him, it says, you were the anointed cherub that covers covers with overshadowing and in the amplified in the brackets they say un overshadowing wings well okay you can do without that I mean we need to look beyond just well okay wings overshadow well yeah they do but overshadowing is not just confined to um, wings and, he, and God says and I set you so you were upon the holy mountain of God you walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. So, before he fell, he was tasked with covering. And he had free access to God's domain. But it says now here in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, that darkness, which is the, the character of, of now Satan who has fallen, is upon the face of the deep. Well, face 
It's kind of like the word surface. Get, get this. The face, if we're not talking about a, a person or an animal, the face of something is the surface of it. I mean, the face of this table is, you know, it, it's um, varnished wood, okay? We're not really seeing uh, how it's constructed underneath. We're just looking at the, the, the top uh, appearance of the thing. Okay, that's the face, the surface, the, the topmost visible part of something. And it says this is where darkness was now covering. See, before, Lucifer was covering the throne of God. And now he's fired from that job, so he's covering something else. What is he covering? He's covering the face, the surface of the deep. Now, this may seem like a nitpicking thing here, but that doesn't mean that Satan is in the deep. He's covering the surface of it. And this is because the deep doesn't belong to him. The deep belongs to God. We'll get to that in a minute, but let's see what this covering stuff amounts to. Keep the place in Genesis. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I know this is going to seem like review to some of you, maybe most of you, but there's a lot of little fine points in here I'd like to point out that, that I think are relevant for us in dealing with the world as it confronts us in this time. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. Paul says, We have renounced disgraceful ways, secret thoughts, feelings, desires, and underhandedness, and methods and arts that men hide through shame. Well, see, that's covering. When people do something sneakily, they're covering. And we refuse to deal craftily, to practice trickery or cunning, or to adulterate or handle dishonestly the word of God. But we state the truth openly, clearly, and candidly, and so commend ourselves in the sight and presence of God, and to every man's conscience. You know, people... This is one of those things, kind of like the sailors knew they were getting close to land. People kind of know when you're not dealing straight with them. They can smell it. I don't, I don't know how to say it exactly, but you just kind of know, even in the world, I think people just kind of know when, when people are trying to pull the wool over their eyes. It's like, nah, I don't trust that. But, you know, that distrust thing can arise whenever they're being deceived, now, they may, they may not catch it, and they may go along with it, and it may do its dirty work. But after the fact, they'll probably say, well, you know, I knew I shouldn't have done whatever that was. Okay. Verse 3. But even if our gospel, the glad tidings, is hidden and obscured and covered, so what Satan does, right? Covered with a veil that hinders the knowledge of God, it's hidden to those who are perishing and obscured to those who are spiritually dying, and veiled to those who are lost. You know, you wonder why the world doesn't understand these things. It's because the devil is covering their understanding. For the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the unbeliever's mind that they should not discern the truth, preventing them from seeing the illuminating light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image and likeness of God. Now, in, a, in the next message, the Lord willing and the creek don't rise, as the expression goes, I'm going to talk about another tool that is really almost everywhere in our world, and that's imaging. You know, every, there's cameras, there's smartphones, there's, there's MRIs, there's CT scans, there's satellites, there's Skype cameras. 
uh, there's digital cameras, there's movie cameras. I mean, you're looking at me on a screen probably. So imaging, it, 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 this, the world runs on imaging, right? And God wants us to image something. In fact, when he said he created us in his image, that's really not saying that we look like God or God looks like us because we look like all kinds of different things. Nor would it say that that in a human being, you look at, at a human being and say, well, that's what God looks like. No. Really, a better way to understand the grammar there is to say God created us as imagers of God. God created us so that we could reflect or we could display His image. We'll talk about that Sunday. Back to Genesis chapter 1. Darkness was on the face of the deep. Well, since we're talking about depth finding, I thought I'd better look up the word deep in Strong's Concordance to see what this word actually means in Hebrew. And I was very surprised because... The, the meaning of the word, not necessarily the word itself, but what that word means shows up a lot of places in the Bible. More places than I'm going to go into tonight. The word basically means an abyss. Uh, a, a, a realm that is beyond our three-dimensional space. It, it, it's, it's that which is um, beyond man's scrutiny, I think it says in one place in the, in the New Testament. And not only is it beyond man's scrutiny, but another thing that Strong's Concordance says about it is that it is a surging mass. Or we could even say a surging mass. I would, would hesitate to say a mess because it's, it's something that God has created, but it's like, it's, it, it's moving. It's not static. It's not just, you know, sitting there doing nothing. It, it's, it's constantly uh, blossoming, constantly bubbling, constantly producing. See, this is the way God is. God is life. He's not death. So the, the deep would be where things come from. And it's related to another word, which actually means to agitate or make an uproar. And this is particularly interesting applied to our time because, keep the place in Genesis and go to Luke chapter 21. This is one of those reasons why we as sailors on the sea of 2022 know that we're getting close to something is because this description here in Luke 21, 25 describes the world pretty much the way I see it. It says, There will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and upon the earth there will be distress, trouble, and anguish of nations in bewilderment and perplexity, without resources, left wanting, embarrassed, in doubt, not knowing which way to turn at the roaring and the echo and the tossing of the sea. Now, that may have, actually may have some literal application, you know, we're, we're hearing through some sources that there is a lot of tectonic movement going on in the Pacific side of the world. Uh, there was just yesterday, there was a big volcano in Mexico. And they're also starting to see some indication that the Popocatépetl volcano just outside of Mexico City is beginning to rumble to life, and that would not be a good thing because Mexico City is a huge city, and if that thing goes off, a whole bunch of people are in trouble. But 
Yes, if, if there were a lot of earthquake activity on the Pacific side of things, uh, there would be tsunamis. And since there are so many cities that are built on the Pacific Ocean, and on the Atlantic, and on the Gulf of Mexico, and the Mediterranean, and everywhere for that matter, if the, if the water level rises in any of those places, then yes, a lot of people are in peril. But maybe this means more than just literally that the oceans are going to rise. Maybe this is telling us something about time, about uh, periods of, of history, that they come to a zenith, that they come to, uh, to a boiling point, if you will. And I think that's where we are now. You know, Steve talks about this on Friday night. But more than that, this, is, this, this effect that we're reading here in Luke 21, 25 arises out of the meaning of what the deep is. Things come from the deep. They don't just, you know, it's not just, uh, you know, one plus one equals two. It's not just everything on the surface. Now, as I said, the devil messes with the surface. But there's a thing, I, I, I principle that I say all the time and that we need to keep this in mind. The devil does not create anything. He's not equipped to create anything. In fact, that's an advantage humans have over Satan is humans can create stuff. The devil cannot create anything. He can only pervert. He can only twist and change and, and re-explain and redirect what's there. But he, he get, makes a lot of hay out of that. So what the devil does then with the deep. He's, he's covering the surface of the deep. And as such, anything that, that is there in the unseen, unknown realm that is beyond man's scrutiny, he has explanations. He has um, techniques. He has systems. Uh, you know, I'm speaking of the occult when I talk about all of that. But see, the occult is not something Satan has created. The occult is, is merely Satan shining his depth finder down into the deep things and say, oh, what's down there? Oh, I could take that and I could twist that and I could make that into astrology. Or I could take that and I could twist that and make that into mind control. Or I could take that and I could make that propaganda. That, that's all of those things are, are twistings of something that is deep. It's deeper than just, you know, everyday life. And let me give you an example. Go to Revelation. You let the place in Genesis go. Go to Revelation chapter 2. There's some interesting language used here. I guess we should kind of roll into this to kind of give you the big picture and then let me discuss the, the thing about depth and how the devil twists it. Okay, Revelation chapter 2 verse 18. To the angel of the assembly of Thyatira, write, These are the words of the Son of God, who has eyes that flash like a flame of fire. No darkness in him is there, and whose feet glow like bright and burnished and white hot bronze. And here's what he says. I know your record and what you are doing, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your recent works are more numerous and greater than your first ones. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel. And he's not talking about King Ahab's wife, but there's a pattern there. You see, there's something... <clears throat> I, I, I will digress just a little bit here. There's something that needs to be understood in order to understand end-time prophecy. And that is what is described in, in the first part of the book of Ecclesiastes, 
where Solomon recognizes that the thing which has been is what will be and that there's nothing new under the sun. That there are patterns, there are things that, that continue and they may express themselves in different ways at different times throughout history, but it's really all kind of the same thing. The devil doesn't have any new tricks. So whatever, how, whatever the, the manipulation that he did through Jezebel, the wife of Ahab, who was the daughter of the prince of, of Sidon, uh, who was an idolater. So we're basically talking about idolatry here, which our world is full of. And their world in Thyatira in Asia Minor back then was full of. Okay, these are the words of, of God. I know your works, but, verse 20, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. So what, what does this mean? This means that even though it's evil and it's wrong, she is packaging it in a way that appears to be righteous, appears to be Christian, at least to these people, okay, claiming to be inspired, who is teaching and leading astray my servants and beguiling them to practice sexual vice and eat food sacrificed to idols. Now, in modern times, we understand sexual vice pretty well, but the food offered to idols is like, well, mm, what, what do we mean by that? Well, in their idolatry, they had great feasts. Okay, just like, uh, you know, God established feast days for Israel. So we're, we're talking about uh, the good things of life, living the good life. You know, uh, eat, drink, and be merry. Uh, you know, do your thing. If it feels good, do it. And I will say, just as an aside, there does seem to be an element of that being preached in modern Christianity in America. So I, I would say they need to watch out that they're not falling into being beguiled by this spirit here. But then he says in verse 21, I gave her time to repent, but she has no desire to repent of her immorality and refuses to do so. Take note, I will throw her on a bed of anguish and those who commit adultery with her, I will bring down to pressing distress and severe affliction, which is kind of what the great tribulation uh, of the, the end times of the last three and a half years, especially the last 40 days, is going to be. Unless they turn away their minds from conduct such as hers and repent of their doings. And I will, make, I will strike her children, her followers, dead. And all the assemblies shall recognize and understand that I am he who searches the minds, the thoughts, the feelings, and the purposes, and the inmost hearts. Well, those are deep, right? We're not just talking about what is being preached or how people are acting. We're talking about intentions here. Okay. And I will give to each of you as what your deeds, as to what you have done, as to what your work deserves. Okay. And I know a lot of Christians say, well, wait a minute. We're not judged by our works. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point out something here in a minute. But just put that on the side for the second. Verse 24, I want you to look at this. But to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching. See, this was not uniform. It was not universal. It was probably very subtle, but not everybody was buying into it. It said, but the rest of you who do not hold this teaching, who have not explored and known the depths of Satan as they say. I will not lay upon you any other burden, only hold fast to what you have until I come. Now, on the surface reading, it appears to contradict what I said a moment ago, that the devil doesn't have any deep things. Well, if the devil had deep things, he wouldn't have put that as they say in there. 
I'll give you an, another example of that. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. <clears throat> we could say it this way. Another translation would be so-called deep things of Satan. You know, any, any occult or heretical teaching that's out there is sold to the public as, well, this is deep. You know, this is, this is profound. This is, this is something you're not going to get on every street corner. You know, this is special. Now, let me say, what we do here at Romans 8 Church and on this YouTube channel we do that. We say this is special. You know, if you go to First Medo Baptist Presbycostal Church somewhere, you're probably not going to hear what we're preaching. Okay? It's special in that sense. But we are not saying that, uh, you know, we, um, we are the owners of this revelation. You know, this is, not, this is not ours so we can control you or so we can pull you into our fold and, and have, you know, have you as our own. Okay, but my point was, there in Revelation chapter 2, verse 24, he said that what they thought was the depth of Satan, he said they're just calling that the depth of Satan. In fact, they may not even be bringing Satan into it. They may just be calling this a deep thing, a so-called deep thing, and what uh, the angel is telling John is it's from Satan. This, this so-called deep revelation that they think they're getting, it's really from Satan. Now let me tell you why linguistically I believe that's what's actually being said and not that the devil has deep things. And I'll give you more reasons why I, I know that Scripture says the devil does not have deep things. But there's this in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. Okay, they're deep as far as the unsaved man on the street is concerned because they're spiritual. Okay, so they're deep in that sense. But are they deep like God's depths? No. And here in 1 Timothy 6 verse 20, it says, O Timothy, guard and keep the deposit entrusted to you and turn away from irreverent babble and godless chatter. Now, babble and chatter are not very deep, generally speaking. Now, I guess to, to some people, it's like, if you don't understand it, it, it's like we say, well, it's all Greek to me. Okay, but that's not what he's talking about here. He's not talking about something, well, you're just not schooled in this, so of course it's going to all sound like nonsense to you. I mean, I could start talking to you about some of the you know, things of, of advanced music theory, and if you're not a musician, it's like, oh, that's just gobbledygook. Okay, right? But we're not talking about that. He says, what these people are teaching, and we're gonna t I'm going to show you who these people are. What they're teaching, he calls babble and chatter. He says, with vain and empty worldly phrases... Whatever the devil has got to sell as deep, he ain't going to sell it unless it sounds right to worldly people, unless it sounds right within a worldly context. Okay? Worldly phrases and the subtleties and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge and spiritual illumination. See, that's what the, the teaching of Jezebel was. It was falsely called teaching and spiritual illumination. Now, there's some interesting Greek in this because the word um, knowledge here is gnosis. That's the Greek word for knowledge. And in the first century, at the time when the New Testament was being written, the one of the prominent heresies was what they called the Gnostics. And the Gnostics claimed to have special revelation that they got either from angels or they got it from, you know, grave sucking or, or some other weird activity. And see, these things are still going on. 
and are still being sold to Christians as deep revelation. And it isn't. It's weird. Okay, I'll give you that. If, if to you deep means weird, okay, then the devil does have weird things, but that doesn't mean they're deep like God. I'll give you that. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 29. Verse 29. 29, 29. In the year 29, 29. Remember that song from when I was in high school. Okay, Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret <coughs> things belong unto the Lord our God. The, deep, the depths are His. Okay? If the devil's coming, if he's dredging something out of there and misusing it, it's not his. He, he's, he's usurping it. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all of the words of this law or that we may be doers of the word, should I say. Now, we have it in the New Testament expressed this way. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I know I'm running you all through the Bible, but hey, put your thing on pause. If, if I'm moving too fast for you, hit the pause button and look the scriptures up and then hit play again and we'll roll on, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9. The deep things are God's. And in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9, it says, What eye has not seen and ear has not heard and has not entered into the heart of man. Now that's deep, right? All that God has prepared, made, and keeps ready for those who love him. The deep things are for us who hold him in affectionate reverence, promptly obeying him and gratefully recognizing the benefits he has bestowed. I recommend you do that if you want deep things. Yet to us, verse 10, God has unveiled and revealed them by and through his spirit. For the Holy Spirit searches diligently exploring and examining everything, even sounding, here's the depth finder, even sounding the profound and bottomless things of God, the divine counsel and things hidden and beyond man's scrutiny. Now folks, there's a lot of stuff going on right now that is beyond my scrutiny and beyond yours. And we need to know these things. We need to not just, just uh, trudge on and, and hope somehow, some way, God's going to get us through. Well, I mean, okay, He will get you through. I'm not saying worry about that, but I'm saying He's got some understanding for us about the deep things. And He says that through the Holy Spirit, these can be revealed to us. Verse 11, For what person perceives knows and understands what passes through a man's thought except the man's own spirit within him. Now, let me stop you right there. If you are a spirit-filled Christian, you have a responsibility to monitor your thoughts and to recognize that the devil may be taking something that you're thinking and twisting it or are trying to direct your attitudes and your motives and your actions in a way that you know as a, a born-again, spirit-filled Christian that you shouldn't go that way. So your spirit is capable. In fact, your, God holds us responsible to do this, for our spirit man to monitor the thoughts that are coming in. You know, it's like, like a, 
a, a radio or a TV channel. He, he wants us to, to be sitting there and monitoring this thing. And you know, like back in the day, I don't know if they do this much anymore, but back in the day, if somebody said a cuss word on TV, it would get beep, it would get bleeped out. Well, you know, God expects us to beep out some stuff that the devil puts in our head. Okay. And just so, no one d discerns or comes to know and comprehend the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. <clears throat> but we have not received the Spirit that belongs to the world, but the Holy Spirit who is from God, given to us, that we might realize and comprehend and appreciate the gifts and favor so freely and lavishly bestowed upon us by God. Let me give you an example, a, a, a very simple, personal example of how God has done that for me with regard to my understanding of the Bible and my understanding of spiritual things. And we talk about this a lot at Romans 8, about what I call navigating the straits. But let me, let me tell you how this works. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. Go to Matthew chapter 7. There in, in Acts, when we started, they were getting close to land, and the, the sailors realized if they got too close to land, the ship was going to run aground, or it was going to run into rocks, and it was going to wreck. Well, our lives are like that. We need to not get too close to certain things or there'll be a mess. We, we, we've got to make sure that we find the deep water to navigate through. The, the deep water is where the things of God we can sound out and it's, it's bottomless, it's fathomless. But you get too close on either side. Even if we're talking about something straight out of the Bible, you get too far one direction or, or the other direction and if you go with that and assume that's God's word and that's God's will and that's his truth and it isn't, you're going to be messed up. It's going to affect you in an adverse way. And this word straight applies. You know, in, in geography, whenever there's two pieces of land, like, like uh, okay, there's North Africa and then there's Gibraltar at the south part of Spain. Well, going between those two is what they call the Strait of Gibraltar. Okay, so that there's actually a geographical application to this. When, when water has to go between two masses that are close together, it's a strait. That's the word, S-T-R-A-I-T. Well, there's a scripture here that all my life I thought it was saying S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T, like straight, like going right down the middle of the highway. And okay, you can interpret it that way if you want to, but that's not all that it meant. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 says, Enter through the narrow gate. That's a better... Uh, in, in fact, let me read this out of the King James. Matthew 7, verse 13 in the King James says... Enter ye in at the straight, S-T-R-A-I-T. Enter at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many are they which go therein. But straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth to life and few there be that find it therein. Well, I want to find the, the way that leads to life. So it says, the way that leads to life is like navigating a strait. Well, I'll give you at least two different ways in which with the Bible. I'm not talking about with the 6 o'clock news. Or I'm not talking about uh, with any other thing you might be listening to. There's There's... Two ways that 
understanding the Bible, you need to navigate a straight. And the first way is when Scripture seems to contradict itself. It says one thing in one place and then seems to say exactly the opposite another place. And some people will get frustrated when they are, are confronted with that or else they'll say, well, I like this one over here and I don't like that one over there or I think this one applies to me and that one over there doesn't apply to me so I'm going to go with this one over here. I recommend you don't do that because the straight has to take into account both concepts and you have to find, I'll call it a middle ground, but that almost sounds like a compromise. And I'm not talking about compromise here. You have to find a way to find your way through both things. It's like both things are true, but your way has to take both of those into account. My favorite one of those, of course, is in Proverbs chapter 26. There's two verses right next to each other that directly contradict each other. Proverbs 26, verse 4 and 5. Verse 4 says, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you also be like him. We know that's some pretty good wisdom. Is some people are just so full of themselves and so full of hot air that if you try to argue with them, they're just going to slap you down. Uh, and, and, you know, you can be right and they're still going to slap you down. But then the next verse says, Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes and conceit. Well, the difference I see there, the, the straight that you have to navigate is you have to, you have to get a good reading on this so-called fool. You, you have to know... Is he teachable? Is he, is he willing to yield to reason or is he not? You know, if, if he's, if he's hard-headed and he's not going to listen to you, then don't answer him because you're just going to have trouble. But if he can be convinced that he's wrong and, and, and not be wise in his own eyes and in his own conceit, then you need to, you need to argue with him. You need to tell him, no, that's not right. You're wrong about that. And, and let me say, having been a fool myself sometimes, I know that there's sometimes I'm the first kind of fool and sometimes I'm the second kind of fool. So this is not just, you don't just make a, a, a snap judgment about a person and say, well, I'm just not going to answer this person or I am going to answer the person. You know, it might be what kind of day they're having. <laughs> It might be, uh, you know, what they ate for breakfast and is that sitting well with them or something. You know, I don't know. Anyway. But there's even more serious ways in which the Bible can seem to contradict itself that we have to find the middle ground where the truth really is in the deep. The deep truth and not a shallow truth. Here, here's, here's the most... The most prevalent example in, in Christian theology, and, and they've been arguing this one for centuries. First of all, Ephesians chapter 2. Let's go read this. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, forms, I would say, the basis of evangelical Christianity. If you are a born-again Christian, you, you have probably at some point in your life heard this and you have taken it in yourself. You, you have, you have uh, thought about this and realized this is, this is God's truth, okay? Okay. Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, For it's by free grace, God's unmerited favor, that you are saved. In other words, you cannot earn your salvation. You cannot be good enough to be saved. 
And God doesn't base your salvation on how good you are. Okay? And, and that because of God's free, free grace, you are delivered from judgment and made partakers of Christ's salvation through your faith. Now, God's not just going to do it regardless of whether you believe or not. You're going to have to believe. But if you believe, He will give you grace. That's simple enough. It says, and this salvation is not of yourselves. It's not your own doing. And it came not through your striving. It's a gift from God. And not because of works, lest any man should boast. It's not the result of what anyone can possibly do, the Amplified says. Okay? Well, there's another place in the Bible that directly contradicts that. James chapter 2. And I know some Christians will throw this one in James out because it's, it so blatantly seems to contradict what we born-again Christians hold to be true that we just read there in, in Ephesians 2. James chapter 2. And this is a straight. This is an example of a theological straight that the devil has used for centuries to get Christians arguing with each other. James 2 verse 14. What is the use or the profit, my brethren, for anyone to profess to have faith if he has no works to show? Can faith save? Well, over there I thought in Ephesians chapter uh, 2 verse 8 it said, yeah, you're saved by, by God because of God's grace and your faith. So faith saves, right? Well, here he says, well, uh, let me read you verse 24. He said, you see, a man is justified and pronounced righteous before God through what he does and not alone through faith. What does that tell you? It tells you that it takes faith and it takes your, as the Amplified puts it in here, obedience as well as what you believe. I like the way Owen Cain used to explain it. He said works in James means corresponding action. That would be the way to navigate through this apparent contradiction. In fact, I think in verse 26 here in James 2, it says, For as the human body apart from the spirit is lifeless, so faith apart from works of obedience or corresponding action, is dead. It's like you don't really have faith if you're not willing to act upon it. it it's just what we call mental assent, perhaps. Now, I will say, regarding scriptural contradictions, there's a whole nother class of scriptural seeming scriptural contradictions that can be solved if you know that the Bible was not originally written in English. And you know that sometimes the translation of the Bible into English might use one English word when in fact the, the original text had two or three or maybe even more original words that all got translated that one word in English. Now, in these cases, it was all the same word. The word for faith, the word for works, the word for um, all of that. Same thing with the fool and the answer and all of that. Those were all the same words in every case. So it was not a question of how the word got translated. But that does happen a lot. And that's why I use Strong's Concordance. That's why if something doesn't make sense to me, there's two things that, that are my go-to remedies. First of all, I ask the Holy Spirit to explain it to me. And then 99 times out of 100, I'll be prompted to look in Strong's Concordance. And lo and behold, over there, that one word, I'll look at this verse, and it's one number, and I'll look at this other verse, and it's a different number. And then I'll go back and look at the definitions of those numbers, and it's like, oh, that's not the same thing. Why did they use the same word? Well... 
it has to do with context. That's, uh, here's another scriptural principle for, for understanding the Bible. Don't just take one verse. Now, I've done some of that here tonight. But don't just take one verse and pull it out of the rest of, of what's being discussed there and, and build your whole theology on that if you haven't read what the whole discussion was. I mean, in James chapter 2, he was talking about mere professions and how people were not living the Christian life. Now, you can modify that and say, well, I don't guess any of us live the Christian life all the time, so does that mean we're saved when we are and we're not saved when we're not? No, it doesn't mean that because God's grace covers that. But see, that's how you, you know, you got the grace over here and you got the works over here. So how do you, you got to navigate between the two. Right? Okay. But then there is another situation where, and the devil loves to do this and not just with the Bible, where it seems like you are presented with two Mutually exclusive options. And neither one of those options is acceptable. Or even good. I'll give you an example in the life of Jesus. Go to John chapter 8. This is deep. I mean, only because Jesus was was filled with the Holy Spirit. And we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the only way that we can do something like he did here. Because otherwise, some fool out there is going to argue you into a corner <clears throat> and you're going to end up throwing your hands up and saying, well, I don't know, maybe you're right when you know good and well they aren't. But because he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he didn't accept either one of the two mutually exclusive options. Okay, you know the story, but I'll read it to you. John chapter 8, verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives early in the morning at dawn, and he came back into the temple court, and people came to him in crowds. And he sat down and was teaching them. When the, some of the scribes and Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and they made her stand in the middle of the court and put the case before him. Teacher, they said, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned to death. But what do you say? <clears throat> they said this, to try to test him, hoping that they might find a charge on which to accuse him. See, they figured that they had him if, if he said, well, yeah, the, yeah the, the, the law says stoner, so you better stoner. And all these people are, are sitting around listening to Jesus talk, and it's like, that's going to be some really bad publicity if he does that. So he, they figure he's probably not going to do that. So he's going to... He's going to gonna say, oh, no, you know, you can, you can set the, the law aside. You know, we don't, we don't have to go by the law. And then they would have something to accuse him. they said, well, see there, you're a false prophet because you're denying what the Scripture says. That's a straight. What did he do? Well, it says Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground. And however, when they persisted, with their question, he raised himself up and said, Let him who is without stone among you be the first, or without fault among you, be the first to throw a stone at her. And then he bent down and went on writing on the ground with his finger. And they listened to him, and then they began going out conscience stricken. Well, Maybe there was a connection with what he wrote on the ground. Maybe there wasn't. Maybe all he had to say was, hey, none of you are without sin. So which one of you is going to be the first one to cast the stone? But see, he didn't, he didn't deny 
that the, the command, thou shall not commit adultery. He didn't deny that that was, was God's word and that that was true. And he didn't, he didn't tell them to go against what it said in Leviticus, but nor did he tell them to go stone her. You know, human courts can do this. I mean, you know, you, you, can, be, um, you can be found guilty of a crime and maybe not acquitted. I mean, you can be acquitted, first of all, and that's why well, they declare you not guilty. But you can even be, uh, you know, convicted of a crime, and the judge can give you parole. Or he can give you uh, probation. Right? And, and that's pretty much what he did with this woman. And, and uh, it says, after they went out, from the oldest down to the least. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing there in the center of the court. And when Jesus raised himself up, he said to her, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And he said, Well, I do not condemn you either. Go your way, and from now on, sin no more. See, he gave her uh, probation. <laughs> It was mercy, but it was probation. He didn't, he didn't say, you're not guilty. He said, oh, well, well I don't see your adultery. He, he just said, stop committing adultery. I'll let you, you know, you're not going to die from being stoned, even though the law said you could be, but quit sinning. And you know, this is really what God says to all of us as Christians. The law, and, and the devil uses the law against us. That's what it says in Revelation chapter 12 verse, verse 9 that he is the accuser of the brethren. What's he doing up there accusing us? He's, 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 writing, a, he's writing on his dirt what all we've done and saying, see there God, they did all of this and we plead the blood of Jesus over ourselves and God says, okay Satan, shut up. I'm giving them probation. But what does he tell you to us? He says, oh, you can, you can keep being, you know, sexually immoral. It doesn't matter. No, he says, quit your sinning. Right? And see, this is something, I think, back to the, the straight between faith and works. This is something where I think maybe Christians in our modern Christianity in America today tend to want to go aground on the grace side to where, well, grace covers it so much that it doesn't matter about your sin. And yes, it does matter about your sin because the devil will use it against you. And God will let him do it. So, Father, <clears throat> we got to get deep. we got to get deeper into the things of you. But I'm encouraged that you say that your spirit sounds the fathomless deep things and that by us seeking you, seeking first your kingdom and your righteousness, that you will reveal those things to us by your spirit. And so, Father, everyone that hears this message, reveal the things that all of us need to know not just about ourselves, but about what's going on in the world around us because it's just a surging mass of, of, of stuff going on. And we know the devil's in the details, but I thank you, Father, that he's not deep, you're deep, and we're deep in you, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.